Lexus, Acura, Infinity, Amati? Today we're gonna to be talking about Mazda's secret luxury brand, why they existed in the first place, and what happened to the V12 luxury sports car that never saw the light of day. Thank you to the Zebra for sponsoring today's video. Even though I've saved a bunch of money by using the Zebra to compare insurance quotes for free, I haven't really changed. I'm still a down-to-earth donut host you know and love. I use the Zebra to compare insurance quotes from the top insurance companies. Uh, head up, please. Of course. And since the Zebra saves people an average of $440 a year on car insurance, it's impressive that I've remained so grounded. Fruit snacks wrapped in gold as requested. I said rose gold, not gold gold. It's different. Uh, can you stay still, please? Uh, I haven't moved an inch. And unlike some other insurance comparison sites, the Zebra doesn't ask for your phone number, so you can shop for insurance hassle-free without worrying about spam calls. You'll be glad to have some privacy, <laughs> much like me. Start saving by going to thezebra.com slash wheelhouse to compare quotes and find your perfect policy. Just remember, Stay humble, like me. During the 1980s, Japan was going through an economic boom which led to extreme levels of financial prosperity among all classes in Japan. But what exactly caused this boom? In September of 1985, Japan, as well as France, Germany, and the United Kingdom signed the Plaza Accord. This accord depreciated the US dollar against the French franc, the German Deutschmark, the British pound, and of course, the Japanese yen. This was drafted in hopes to increase US exports, as well as making purchasing foreign assets easier for Japan, as well as those other countries. This accord, in combination with other expansionary fiscal measures, created a strong yen and an optimistic economy for Japan. And as a result, Japan entered the beginning stages of what was called the Japanese asset price bubble. From 1985 to 1991, Japanese real estate and stock market prices were inflated. The price of land in Japan increased an estimated 550%. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're in Tokyo and you lay a newspaper on the ground. The surface area that the newspaper covered was worth $50,000. If that doesn't mean much to you, at a valuation of $13.47 trillion, Japan's land was valued more than the entire United States. The combined effects of the Plaza Accord with the tremendous inflation allowed businesses in Japan to boom, and that included the automakers. In the years before all this was happening in Japan, the United States was experiencing a different type of change. The gas prices had gone up almost 300% in the United States due to Saudi Arabia placing an oil embargo in 1973, the oil crisis. Even though American consumers wanted more fuel efficient vehicles, their domestic manufacturers were not adjusting to the times fast enough. Cars from the US were gaining a reputation for being cheaply produced, unreliable gas guzzlers. By contrast, Japanese brands were producing reliable and fuel efficient vehicles. This turn of events was catastrophic for American automakers. Japanese car sales in the US increased from a rather small 6.5% market share to more than 20% of the US market by 1980. Japan was doing so well that they had to come to an agreement with the US government to slow down their exports to the US so that American automakers could get back on their feet. This agreement was known as the Voluntary Export Restraint. The Japanese companies were kicking our asses so hard that the Reagan administration threatened to take the ball home if the Japanese didn't play with one arm tied behind their back. The cap was set at 1.68 million vehicles per year. The cap was raised to 1.85 million cars in 1984 and over 2 million in 1985. Japan needed to find a solution to maintaining profits while keeping the number of cars they exported to a minimum. Now armed with the financial backing from the price asset bubble, Japanese automakers were basically juiced up like bodybuilders on steroids. They could develop, manufacture, and export new cars that were on the cutting edge of new technology and very fuel efficient. And because the yen was so strong compared to the dollar, they could do all of this while keeping their costs down. During this time, BMW and Mercedes-Benz were sitting at the top of the luxury car market. Japanese automakers noticed that their luxury cars could be sold at a high price, and that high price could make up for the low volume of cars. So, Japanese automakers got to work developing their own luxury brands. Honda launched Acura with the Legend in 1985 and Integra in 86, while Toyota developed and released a large sedan called the Lexus LS400. Looking at those brands today, you can see the lasting impact those first cars had. While those cars were setting a foundation for Lexus and Acura, what was Mazda working on at this time? Were they working on their jump shot? Were they learning how to 
Crochet? No! Near the end of the 1980s, Mazda was developing a little car called the Miata. Its development actually involved a design competition between their offices in the US and Japan. Rear wheel drive convertible concepts came from the US, and front wheel drive mid-engine concepts came from Japan. That's very strange. Eventually, the US divisions designed one, and when it launched, the Miata's clean design and superb handling was being praised by literally everyone. It was the perfect embodiment of what a sports car should be. Mazda had hit the jackpot with the Miata, and it remains a fan favorite for car enthusiasts to this day. I still want one, I want an NB. The Miata's popularity had pushed Mazda's confidence to an all-time high, and who could blame them? They felt they were in a good enough place to dive into their next endeavor, which was to develop a luxury brand like their domestic rivals, Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. So in 1991, Mazda announced they were creating a new luxury brand called Amati. Miata? Amati? Whoa. What exactly did they have developed at this point? Well, the project for Amati's first car was codenamed Project Pegasus. Their flagship sedan was clearly aimed at the likes of the BMW 7 Series, the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, and of course, the recently debuted Lexus LS400. And more importantly, it was gonna be a V12-powered model called the Amati 1000. V12 luxury sedans were not unheard of at the time, but they were definitely rare. BMW had debuted a new 5-liter V12 in their 7 Series in 1987, and Mercedes had responded with their own in 1991. Mazda would have been just the third V12 entry from a luxury brand. Most of the time, V12s are either six-cylinder engines put together like this. However, Mazda's V12 would have been constructed a bit differently to the German engines. Mazda's early designs show that they essentially would have put three banks of four cylinders together, and this would have made the Amati 1000 engine the first application of a W12 engine. In fact, a W12 design wouldn't be used again until VW produced one for the Audi A8 in 2001. Mazda was in uncharted territory for designing this in the early 90s. Mazda had its eye set on becoming Japan's third big automaker behind Toyota and Honda. With the Amati 1000 being on track to be a game changer for the luxury sedan, things were now looking very promising. For now. During Amati's development, tensions were rising within Mazda. Remember how there was a design competition between Mazda's US and Japan offices for the Miata's design? Well, Mazda believed that because that design competition worked for the Miata, they should do it again with the Amati 1000. In addition, Mazda's lineup had expanded during this time, and they had to shift some of its production to the US to compensate. These two factors actually created some resentment between the two offices. Employees in Japan started accusing the US branch of having quality control issues within their plants, which to their credit were valid. The US produced cars did have build quality issues. However, the Japan branch would begin to experience issues of their own. Mazda was not nearly as big a company as the likes of Toyota and Honda. So they didn't have as much money, like not even close. They couldn't afford basic things for their engineers like new notebooks. Mazda producing a luxury brand and a flagship sedan like the Amati 1000 meant they were punching way above their weight class. By comparison, Lexus spent $400 million just developing the engine for the LS400. It was at this point where all the tension had built up to. At the same time that Mazda's wallet was becoming thin, Japan's economy started to take a nosedive. Japan entered a period called the Lost Decade. However, they would feel the effect of the bubble burst for almost 20 years. Not being able to afford any new projects, the Amati project and all of its development folded immediately. The disappointment from the failed project resulted in Mazda erasing nearly all the evidence that the Amati brand or the Amati 1000 even existed. The resulting shame meant that you would be hard pressed to find anyone outside of retired Mazda executives to mention or even acknowledge Amati as a legitimate project. While Mazda had turned away from the luxury market, their rivals began to thrive. Lexus debuted the LS400 and it immediately put the Germans on notice. It was a higher quality vehicle with more features all while being less expensive. The reason why Toyota was able to succeed where Mazda failed was due to the disparity in their financial situations. Simply put, Toyota had way more money to spend. Their development started much earlier in 1983, and they basically threw a billion dollars at the project with the intent of creating the world's best car. Well, Lexus engineers set up shop in Laguna Beach to research how wealthy Americans spent their money. And also, they thoroughly tested their prototypes on the German Autobahns. The LS400 turned out to be so good that Mercedes-Benz blew their budget developing the S-Class successor. But Toyota weren't the only ones to experience success. Honda had developed Acura, and in 1987, Acura's first full year of sales, they sold 109,000 cars with the flagship Legend sedan, accounting for 55,000 sales, and the rest were the smaller Integra. Acura also 
made an interesting hire from what remained of Mazda. Dick Colliver was a former employee of Mazda since the 1970s, and in the aftermath of the failed Amadi project, apparently he said that he took, quote, everything to Honda. All the systems we developed, Mazda didn't do anything with them. They basically threw them in the dumpster, but I kept them in mind. The image programs, the database programs, the dealer development programs, the people, the processes, I took them with me. Acura even started knocking Titans like Ferrari off balance with their new NSX, which had development input from the legendary Ayrton Senna. The NSX was so inspirational that Gordon Murray shifted his inspiration for the McLaren F1 from the Porsche 911 to the NSX. That's huge. Even though Infiniti didn't have the initial success that Lexus and Acura experienced, they eventually carved out their own space in the luxury market starting in the early 2000s. The three biggest Japanese automakers were all experiencing success, while Mazda was still just known for creating a great budget sports car with the Miata. Definitely not what they had in mind for their future. It just goes to show that even if you take the time to make sure that the car was well designed with a great engine, there are huge factors at play when it comes to launching a car brand like politics and good market timing. Japan's economy had reached the highest of highs leading to Japanese automakers actually benefiting enough to the point where they were able to make a leap forward. Unfortunately though for Mazda, they were not one of those companies. Mazda will always be loved for making brilliant sports cars like the Miata, the RX-7, RX-8, even the Mazda Speed 3. However, we can only speculate what the company would look like today if they managed to see their luxury brand Amadi actually take off. Big announcement. The Donut Underground has a shirt now. We got a shirt. Now, if you don't already know, the Donut Underground is our membership club for super fans. Members get access to behind the scenes videos, a Discord server, exclusive stickers, merch discounts, and now, there's a shirt, a freaking shirt. That's the same colorway as our new stickers, which members voted on a couple of months ago. You get input into what we make. The shirt is $25 and only available to underground members. To find out how to join, click the join button down below on this video or on our channel page, or for iOS users, check out the link in the description. We got a shirt! If you wanna know more about Amadi, check out our past gas episode where we devote an entire episode to it. We go a lot more in depth. And if you're interested in Mazda's racing heritage, check out this episode of Up to Speed right here, or let me know if you wanna hear about the 787B, the Mazda race car. We actually did an episode of Past Gas on that as well. Hit that like button, be kind, I'll see you next time.